Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is uh, Zuzana, and I'm happy to introduce our topic today, which is the final event of our SCORES project, uh, Hybrid Domestic Energy Systems uh, of the Future. Uh, this webinar is organized by European Funded Project SCORES, uh, co-organized with the uh, Buildup, and currently joined by our cluster project, uh, HighBuild. A recorded version of this uh, webinar will be available. Uh, so feel free to follow the project uh, website at scores-project.eu and our profiles on Twitter and LinkedIn, where we uh, post regularly. We'd love to hear from you uh, during this event. There is a question function in the tool. Uh, please share your questions and any comments uh, during the event, anytime during the event. Uh, we have a Q&A session planned right after the presentation of the technologies of the uh, SCORES project. Uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, today's first presenter, uh, Pavel Bodish. Uh, he's a systems integrator at TNO and technical coordinator of the SCORES uh, project. Pavel will uh, introduce uh, the topic and the SCORES project to all of you. Uh, Pavel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Susanna, for a nice introduction. Uh, and I uh, would like to also welcome all of you to who are listening uh, and looking at our uh, our final SCORES event. As clearly from the title, this uh, this event is about uh, a SCORES project, uh, and the SCORES project uh, is an European Horizon 2020 uh, project uh, that is focusing on combining and optimizing uh, um, energy generation, uh, consumption, and conversion uh, uh, of renewable energy storage system, uh, uh, which is connected to various kinds of grids. Uh, effectively, what we try to do, we try to combine various sto storage and conversion technologies in buildings, and we try to connect them via a, a building energy management system that should make a ch smart choices about how the con energy locally produced should be also locally consumed, uh, so that the energy grids are as little as possible uh, uh, used in the system and thus less and less uh, expenses has to be uh, made in order to maintain and build those energy grids. Uh, obviously, uh, reliable operations and positive business case are essential for, uh, for, for, for towards our results, as only then we can uh, apply this technology towards wider range of buildings. The project uh, uh, it starts, it started about four, uh, four years ago and uh, has uh, 12 partners, nine work packages uh, and uh, a budget from the European Commission of Subsidy of about 6 million euros. Uh, in principle, as I mentioned, we're looking at, um, at using the uh, uh, renewable energy generated in the building to be used directly by the building itself. And for that, we have to deal with the unpredictability of the energy supply from the renewable uh, uh, solar, uh, solar, solar, solar energy sources. <clears throat> and uh, we use various kinds of storage systems. That is why hybrid storage system in order to buffer that energy and use it at the right moment in time when the demand is there. Uh, on the demand side, we obviously have the typical story of every building, electricity use, domestic auto to use, space heating, as well as in this case, refeeding the energy back to the, back to the grids. When I zoom in a little bit towards the partners that are involved in the project, uh, we have the uh, several uh, research institutes, namely uh, TNO from the Netherlands, IA Intech, uh, from uh, uh, from uh, Austria, but we also have quite a number of large or small medium-sized companies, uh, among others, uh, non-Siemens, EDF, uh, Rina, Stadtwerk, Gleisdorf, uh, uh, etc. Each of those companies brings in specific know-how or technology to the project that is uh, heavily used uh, towards our system solutions. Objectives of our project have been already mentioned, but in principle, we are looking at targeting the increased self-consumption of the energy in the built environment, in buildings, and minimizing the impacts of the uh, locally generated uh, uh, renewable energies towards the grids. Uh, more specifically towards technologies, we are applying second life uh, lithium-ion batteries uh, coming from buses. Uh, we are also uh, applying in our systems uh, optimized electrically driven heating system on the basis of PCMs. Uh, we have also heat 
uh, let's say various kinds of heat pumps, whether that's air to uh, water or water to water uh, driven heat pumps uh, for hot water, water or space heating solutions. Uh, we apply also very innovative solution of long term and uh, medium term storage uh, that is uh, that is aimed to be as loss free as possible. Uh, and all of this, as mentioned before, is managed by uh, energy management system uh, uh, as well. We feel zooming into the demo cases. We have uh, two um, on high level, two different kind of demo cases. One on the right side shown the demo case in France, uh, and as typically for France, the buildings are prepared for to be strongly electrified. Uh, uh, and what we apply there is uh, various kinds of technologies, as mentioned before, whether that is water to water heat pump, uh, PCM uh, uh, electrical heaters, PV collectors, uh, uh, as well as PVT collectors. Uh, and uh, the aim is also to apply a long term storage system in this demonstration. Uh, contrary to the, let's say, electrically driven system in France, in Austria, the system uh, that we are using for demonstration is. Uh, district heating based system uh, so it's quite different configuration and uh, but the, the individual components are very similar to the system uh, in France uh, if I go into a specific pictures on the of the of the demonstration itself uh, you can see that in the on the top which you see a picture on France is a large residential buildings of about 115 small apartments uh, used for uh, as used often by elderly people. Uh, yet in Austria, we talk about uh, six uh, regular residential uh, houses. Uh, so the configurations are quite different. Different. The scale is also quite different, and the interface with the various kinds of grids is also quite different. Using this uh, approach, we are trying to show and calculate also in our modeling tools what would be the impact of scaling up our uh, solution towards the building stock at various places in the Europe. That would be it from my perspective and I would like to then give uh, the word back to Susanna. Thank you very much Pavel for the introduction of the SCORES project. Now going uh, more into uh, detailed information, the SCORES technologies, uh, I would like to introduce Hans Hennig. Uh, energy energy at, uh, engineer at Siemens, who will uh, talk about the building energy management system developed for uh, SCORES. And the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Susanna. Um, but before we dive into the world of building energy management systems, I should explain why you use one. Um, most cases or most buildings have a building management system, um, but it's simply not capable of handling energy. Uh, as a, a, a control medium. They look ahead, but they don't really act on the information. Perhaps if you're lucky, then the, the, the solar radiation will be uh, will be used. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Um, as Pavel said, we have two sets of demo systems. You can see the generation equipment on top here and the equipment below the execution equipment. We devised a system in which the, the BEMS is kind of a, a brain above it. It takes in market signals uh, weather data and uh, domestic profiles, the strategy, and it, ex uh, it pipes that down to the, the execution equipment in the, in the field. Same setup for Austria, slightly different, oops, one too far, slightly different setup, but same principle, devised from the top, piped down to the execution. The system we've built consists of a server where the algorithms are running, where the logging is done, where the, the, the weather API comes in, some communication stuff, the, the controller that executes all the commands that have been set up by the, by the BEMS, some interfacing equipment here, and some auxiliary equipment to make it all work, to power supply, stuff like that. Um, on the server, two algorithms are running, one prediction algorithm and one decision algorithm. The prediction algorithm predicts as the name suggests, all the stuff that's uh, that needs predicting, like solar, the, the gain, the solar energy gains, like the status of charges and buffers, the user profiles, stuff like that, and it devises uh, a net consumption profile. Basically, how much energy you have left in one hour, and then the decision algorithm decides what to do with that amount of energy, uh, and it can optimize either for self-consumption or it can optimize. For, uh, for cost. And what you're basically doing is calculating the, the basically this curve. 
the, the curve that says we have energy left or we have uh, energy shortage. And the, jo the job of the BEMS is actually very simple. You see this blue area where the, uh, there's an energy surplus. We have to distribute that area over the area where there is a shortage. And in theory, that's relatively easy. In practice, as you can see here, the, the pictures from the simulation, it's a little bit more tricky, but it's, it's doable. To do this, we've built some kind of an interface to see all the, um, the results of the, of the field equipment. This one is for the, the domestic cold water system. You can see here the, the various signals. You can see the statuses. This one is for the, for the CLC. And talking about the CLC, we do field tests to see if the, the, the equipment behaves as we want it to behave. So we've asked it to uh, charge twice and to discharge a little bit further on. And what you see happening in practice is that the CLC indeed charges two times and that it discharges a little bit later on. Um, when charging or discharging happens, energy is, uh, is released and you see the, the, the temperature in the buffer increasing. So that's exactly the behavior we want. One time we had an opportunity to field test without really testing it. We had a system in the a system error in the district heating. Building had cooled down over the weekend. You can see here the temperatures of the building in Austria. Uh, supply 20 degrees. I got a call at nine in the morning. So we switched on the system. Uh, and you can see the system delivered energy. Temperatures inside the buffer go down, inside the building go up. And around here you reach some kind of a, a, an equilibrium where the, the building is up to temperature again and um, people are comfortable in there. At about three in the afternoon, the district heating was re repaired again and the systems uh, switched off and the temperatures inside the district heating system go up and the buffer is re replenished. Although we are in the middle of the, of the testing period and still an awful lot of work needs to be done, there are a few lessons we already can draw from this. One is for all kinds of reasons things go other in another way than you planned um, and for to solve that you need people with all kinds of different backgrounds ranging from mechanical to electrical but also network people or IT specialists and they all have to work together otherwise you, you cannot solve the problems that that occur when you look at the future you see a map of the Netherlands and you see most of it is red that means there is a problem with feed-in uh, possibilities for solar and for for wind that means the, um, the systems like BEMS will be will become standard in the future and very soon because this is a problem you, you cannot so, you cannot solve easily. So in order to do that, you need some kind of self-learning uh, BEMS algorithms to be able to cope with these large amounts of uh, yeah of problems in the in the network. Um, that's it from me. I'll uh, hand you back to Suzanne. Uh, which is on heat pumps, and uh, our presenter is uh, Clement Dumont, mechanical engineer at uh, Heliopac. So, uh, Clement, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, uh, Susanna. Hello, everyone. I will uh, <clears throat> do a quick presentation uh, about the heat pumps uh, from uh, my company, Heliopac, that we installed um, on the demonstration site. Um, so we have a uh, mature technology uh, and the, the main challenge uh, into the core of this project was to communicate with uh, uh, the BEMS, for example. Um, here is a, a schema about uh, the installation on Azure. Uh, we have uh, actually three heat pumps uh, to provide the, the three heat pumps with a total power of uh, 36 kilowatts. Uh, to provide uh, the domestic hot water for the building. And um, the, the system is, uh, the, the collector is on the roof uh, and uh, we use uh, PVT panels that are uh, hybrid panels that provide uh, photovoltaic energy and uh, also uh, works as a heat source. Um, these panels are uh, manufactured by uh, Dualsen, that is a, a French uh, company. 
And here we can see a photo of the um, took on uh, the roof at Agen. We can see the piping uh, that is behind the, the photovoltaic cells uh, that uh, works as uh, the heat, uh, heat source. Uh, on uh, Glaisdorf, um, in Austria, we have a, a very different installation that is uh, not a classical one because uh, the heat source is uh, the district heating. So we built a dedicated system for this course project. Um, and of course, uh, the heat pumps are linked to the, to the BEMS. Uh, from Siemens uh, via uh, mode based communication. And uh, the main learning uh, in, in scores was uh, mainly is uh, how do we communicate with the BEMS? Um, we have to define the relevant variables and to adapt all uh, of uh, the regulation softwares. Uh, we choose to use uh, uh, variable flow circulators in agent. Uh, this way we can improve the precision of the regulation and uh, they act uh, in place of the usual on-off uh, circulators. And uh, the specific system in Glassdorf uh, is that uh, we experience uh, the dy dynamic stratification uh, because uh, the system works uh, for both uh, domestic hot water and uh, space heating. And we have uh, one water tank. And uh, from this water tank, we have two uh, outlets at a different height and uh, so different temperature. And uh, this is something uh, we, we developed for uh, the scores uh, experimentation. Thank you. I will uh, let uh, Pavel uh, speak uh, again. Thank you very much, uh, Clement. Uh, as as Clement said, uh, our next speaker is again Pavel, who will uh, talk about the se seasonal thermal energy star uh, storage. So, Pavel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, so, in these uh, several slides, I will uh, show you the current status and example of an, how one can tackle a long-term storage of energy in uh, in uh, or around the buildings. Uh, to be very specific, I'm going to show you uh, what is the status of the current uh, CLC seasonal thermal storage uh, technology, which we have uh, decided to uh, rename to a redox heat storage technology. Historically, chemical looping or CLC or chemical looping technology has been developed for uh, power generation applications uh, uh, with uh, where the separation of CO2 is taking place. Uh, and it's also based on a metal oxidation and reduction processes, as is our uh, approach here. However, the technology has been adopted from industry towards built environment uh, and scaled down significantly to be able to be applied in buildings. Major advantage of this technology over many other types of storage technologies is its uh, inherent high energy density, which on a system level uh, should be able to reuse values of well above one gigajoules per cubic meter in comparison, hot water reaches about 0 0.15 or 0 0.18 gigajoules per cubic meter. Uh, uh, this technology uh, of uh, redox heat is uh, uh, relatively straightforward from the uh, from the process perspective, and I will explain it to you on the on the on the picture on the right side. In principle, you can start within your uh, storage system with uh, a pure metal. In our case, we use copper, and uh, when you heat it up and bring uh, uh, air inside the inside the reactor, the oxygen in the air converts the metal to to, to the metal oxide, so copper oxide. Uh, that process releases significant amount of energy as effectively it's, uh, it's an oxidation process. If you want to reverse it, you bring in into the reactor, the same reactor, uh, hydrogen. And uh, that process is in, in fact for copper, also exothermic, so also energy is generated and uh, the metals converted, back, uh, converted from the oxide back to uh, a pure metal. 
uh, this process is quite reversible and uh, as we, I will show on the following slides. Before I get to that, I will first want to show you uh, how the system uh, is aimed to be connected to buildings. So what you see on this side, on the left side is obviously a, a, an example of a building uh, via heat exchanger, uh, a, a buffer system, so buffer vessel is uh, connected to the, to, to, the, to the house. And inside the buffer are placed uh, individual reactors from the copper, as I've described before, which can be using air from the pump or hydrogen from the from the hydrolyzer converted to either uh, pure metal or uh, oxide respectively uh, water that's generated in the process of, of the of the uh, oxidation is uh, condensed and used later on for a process of reduction towards feeding towards uh, the hydrolyzer um, how does it really look like however so what you see on the left side here on the picture is a lab a lab experimental setup where we have the developments and, uh, and scale the technology to over appropriate size for the for the for the buildings and on the right side you see the example of the uh, clc or redox heat reactor where inside of the of this uh, red tube uh, uh, copper is uh, placed uh, what you see on this picture is large amount of connections from the side, which are uh, thermocouples or, or temperature sensing points with which we are able to monitor and control the process of, uh, of oxidation and reduction of copper. Uh, on the next picture, you see a zoom in into the how the inner side inside of the of our reactors look like. So you see also that uh, this is the top side of view. So you see quite a number of heating elements over here to be able to start the reaction. And the reaction after being started up and the reaction reactive gases are brought in whether that is oxygen in air or hydrogen uh, continues from the top towards the bottom or bottom to the top by itself so you only initiate the reaction at the beginning and it, and it goes through the complete reactor by itself self-sustaining its own uh, process uh how does it look like in this you know from scientific perspective what you see on this graph is uh, temperature on the x uh, on the y-axis and time on the on the on the on the x-axis uh, and what you see is as the time passes by individual peaks are coming up and down these peaks are effectively thermocouples as i've shown in the previous picture measuring temperature uh, at various height as you can see from the top to the bottom of the reactor uh, and what we see is that basically your heat wave passes nicely through the complete reactor from the top to the bottom, uh, uh, reaching the end of the reactor and uh, dying out uh, at the end because the process has been fully, uh, fully finalized. Um, this technology has been developed over the last four years, and at the moment the status is that we have been able to reach about half a meter of a conversion system in two separate uh, reactor points meaning that the technology is currently uh, effectively ready to be also demonstrated in the field. However, we had to proceed about one and a half years ago with uh, implementation of an emulator system into the demonstration, so the demonstrations themselves can also run. So unfortunately, the hydrolyzer as well as the copper technology has not been demonstrated in the demonstration sites. Uh, and in order to be able to enable the demonstration sites to continue uh, through the testing, we have uh, built an emulator system that, 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 that basically behaves qua dynamics in a similar way as the real system would. Again, you see a reactor here. You see a buffer system placed next to it via, via pumps. Uh, the energy is being pumped in there and then via heat exchanger can be placed into the into the building itself in practice what you see on this picture is an example of the reactor nicely insulated uh, and what you see further are examples of uh, pictures of how the setup has been built so what you see here's on the back side the reactor and, be, and behind that is the buffer vessel itself um, what are the next steps? Uh, as I mentioned, the prototype of the redox heat reactor uh, and the system has been built and fully tested in the lab. Uh, demonstration system has been placed, an emulator has been tested and installed in Austria and works quite well. And the next steps would be then we have to look at uh, two aspects mainly and to increase the number of cycles that this reactor can manage to do from about five, six to you need to aim to at least 20 or 50. And uh, uh, we have to also look at critically on the cost of the system, as uh, this is going to be a major challenge for the commercial 
application of this system. And I think this was the last slide, so I'll give back uh, my word to Susanna. Thank you very much, Pavel. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, we will now uh, come back to earlier topic, uh, which is the phase change material, which will be presented by Alexander Leblanc. Uh, please go to 29. Thank you very much. Uh, he's a research and innovation director at uh, Campa. Uh, Alexander, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, on my side, we were in, uh, involved um, to study the opportunity to use a storage capacity located inside the room of the of the of the building. So, especially with storage units using uh, electricity as a, as an energy source. So, yes, the, all the other um, storage technology use a space in the building. Uh, not in the limit of the of the livable space. We, we studied, uh, uh, as you know, for storage, the, the volume that we can use is limited, and it brings uh, extra cost. So we we investigated the the chance to use the indoor space to uh, put the storage capacity. So, for example, on the picture uh, on the right, you have the you have the picture of the unit that uh, provides heat for room heating, but also uh, stores uh, energy on demand. Uh, so it converts electricity as heat to bring uh, thermal comfort in the room. And it's taking almost no space uh, other than the, the, the floor space uh, described on the picture here. So we, we had some constraints. Uh, of course, as it's in the uh, in the room of the inhabitant, it has to be as small as possible. But this is the same constraint as all uh, storage uh, units. Aesthetic, because it is part of the of the decoration. Quiet also, not, not to disturb the, the end user. Uh, efficient and also BEMS interfaceable. So uh, on the technology itself, uh, in the pro in the scores project, we investigated two versions. Uh, the one which is on the right here, which is a Joule effect based, meaning we convert directly electricity to heat uh, with no losses, but with a, a lower efficiency than the version on the left, which is a heat pump based. So we choose a thermodynamic cycle to uh, convert electricity to heat, but with the constraint to use the cold source as a, uh, from the outdoor air, so the, the the heater on the left requires access to the outdoor air, which is a, an installation constraint. Uh, so the two prototypes uh, were investigated during the project. Both have very various constraints, uh, and we will see how it affects also the the, the storage the storage core, which has a different material. Uh, so. Uh, first constraint that I uh, quoted before was to be as small as possible. So the, the first uh, barrier we wanted to uh, have been dropped during the project was uh, to use, instead of classical heat storage heaters, which use bricks or cast iron, risen up at a very high temperature. It's uh, mostly above 400, 500 degrees, uh, which brings the need to have a, a thick insulation layer to uh, prevent the heat to go out of the storage core. We investigated the use of phase change materials, which is a very efficient uh, material to store energy during the phase change. Uh, the phase change enthalpy of the materials we, we chose is very high, but it brings uh, several constraints, including uh, thermal mechanical constraints. So when it uh, gets from solid to liquid phase, it changes its volume, so it's hard to encapsulate. Uh, and the, the material also have a low conductivity. So both of these uh, uh, mechanisms uh, make the material hard to uh, put in service in a, in a commercial appliance. So to solve the two problems, we worked uh, with the partners of the project, and especially IPS, on simulation and mechanical tests 
to uh, optimize the heat conductivity uh, and to optimize the producibility to scale up from a lab prototype to an industrial production. So to encapsulate the phase change material uh, in aluminum profiles, as you see on the right part of the slide, uh, to manage to stack these uh, aluminum profiles uh, one above the other on the top right picture and build uh, a storage cord storage core made of uh, uh, phase change material. Uh, next challenge was also to uh, interface the appliance with the BEMS as the energy that is stored in the uh, appliance has an impact on the end user's comfort. The amount of energy that is stored in the appliance has to be uh, precisely calculated because nobody wants to be out of uh, comfort in his room. Uh, to store energy and uh, consume less energy, to use renewable energy is a uh, is the main uh, purpose of the project. But when you talk about comfort and indoor comfort of end users, you you cannot accept uh, uh, a lack of comfort. So we we worked on the way the the, the load of the storage core is managed uh, by the BEMS. So it's a mix between the the presence absence schedule of the uh, of the end user in the room the weather forecasts and the energy availability um, among all the others um, storage uh, storage uh, units uh, of the building so this technology uh, which is based on the effet joule uh, was is currently uh, being demonstrated in uh, agent so in the various pictures, uh, we uh, yeah, show you the, the building you already saw, but also the, the product on the bottom left uh, picture, which is installed in the, in this, in the, in the bedroom of this retirement uh, home. So it's uh, currently uh, up and running and uh, storing energy to, um, to bring comfort uh, in this uh, indoor space. Thank you uh, for your attention. Thank you very much, Alexander, for your presentation. Our next presenter is Michael Fisher, uh, business unit manager at Canning Metal, who will present uh, the heat battery. Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you, Susanna. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, our main task in that project was to uh, manufacture metal components for the CLC system, what uh, Pavel already showed in his presentation, as well as um, implementing our GVI technology, which is a um, very special and super insulation technology. Um, and in my slides, I will go uh, give you a briefly overview about uh, that particular technology um, in the case of a heat battery. So uh, what we did was um, to fabricate um, a heat battery, sensible heat storage by the use of water. Uh, we called it MK1 and uh, we designed it especially for the purpose of the Austrian demo site. You already saw that container where the buffer tank were installed and you can see um, on the screen the design what we uh, purpose to. Um, after the design phase it was necessary to design it and, um, and went over into construction phase. Um, as you can see here, the system consists of two walls. So our insulation technology is a double wall system. Um, and in between we have a filling material which overtakes the filling purpose as well as um, supporting the walls due to the vacuum which is um, applied onto. And uh, on the right side laying, you can see there it's the inner vessel which is already prefabricated. It consists of a dome head on the bottom as well as on the top side and a tube and uh, standing here to the left side it's the outer shell which take place at the surrounding of the inner one um, on the next page you can see um, a welding process we installed and as you could imagine we have a vacuum insulation it's quite important to have a system which is leak tight that it urates the vacuum over a long time so it's quite important to have um, a good ability to weld as well as the quality aspects are quite important that was the uh, tank when it was ready for commissioning so if you compare it to the design it looks quite similar and we sent it over to t now in the labs to have a characterization 
um, and after having the characterization it went to the installation into the container which was located in Austria as you might have seen before um, in the slides from Pavel and on the right side in the pictures you can see um, our heat battery as well as the reactor which were also produced from us so um, the sister and the brother found together in the in the container in Austria the performance values of that MK1 were quite impressive. So if you take a look at the graph on the left side, um, the, the blue line is the line which uh, is the performance of our tank and the X-S is on the graph. You should take a deeper look into it. It's not ours, it's days. And compared to existing systems, um, the values are quite quite good and interesting. So the next step was to think about in how the the system could be sized to a bigger scale to bring it into a home and therefore we had a couple of discussions with um, tno and um, the final design looked like that project name mk2 the um, volume of that one compared to the first one so the first one had around 100 liters that one has uh, 200 liters approx um, and the value was given due to an analysis we made um, uh, analyzing the advantage of the um, PV systems installed in Europe as well as the consumption given by a two and a half heads household so we arrived at 200 liters and the vessel looked like that so don't be afraid about that uh, system in the background and on the bottom so we need to install that that the system is uh, flexible and movable. Production phase, um, some some pictures here, the laying vessel, that's the inner one again, so consisting a dome head and, uh, at the bottom as well as on the top side, a tube. Um, it was quite long, so it was approx 1.8 meter length. Um, you can see a picture of the system ready for shipment and we already had a, a, a happy customer uh, at TNO, um, so Lawrence really was excited to receive it and install it at TNO to make the characterization. Um, and we found out that the performance values weren't as we expected it in the calculation, so we tried to have a linear um, scaling up on the system, but we implemented also some additional stuff which changes the performance a bit. So the next steps after the characterization of the MK2 was in how um, it fulfills our expectation to a very good system. And it ended up at a project name called MK3. Um, the design is confidential, so I can't show it. The target and the goal is to industrialize that, but it's not a task for, for Königmetall, KMG. Um, it's it's a task for the company NES, which has been founded at the beginning of the year, and the founders of NES are um, three employees from from TNO. One of them you saw, it's Pavel, and the goal of the company is to industrialize that product, the MK3, and we have a quite good situation as KMG because we act as a supplier as well as a shareholder in the company, and we have to trust and. Um, seeing there's a big opportunity for us to bring that product in, in, a, in a market. Um, and the last information on that, and which is a quite interesting one, because um, that cooperation in the NEST project, as well as um, that MK3, is a direct outcome of the SCORES project. So we not just only took place as a partner in, in the SCORES project, which is an R&D project, um, so we have a directly connection to the future and this is a really good situation and uh, thanks to SCORES we found um, a collaboration, a way to establish now NES and bring that product to the market. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you for the uh, presentation of the good outcome of the SCORES project. Now to show uh, the demonstration of the technologies in more detail. Uh, we have our next presenter, Jill Plessis, a research engineer from uh, EDF, who will present the demo site in France. Jill, the floor is yours. Thank you, Susanna. Hi, everyone. Okay, we've been seeing in the previous talks uh, the different uh, technology we were testing in the SCORES project. 
So those technology don't have the same uh, technology readiness, uh, readiness level. And one of the main, let's say, objective also of the SCORES project was not only to develop those technology, but also to test them in, uh, in real life. So test them uh, with the simulation, but also test them in, uh, in uh, implemented uh, in, uh, in demonstrators. Uh, and for that, we've been uh, choosing two locations, as Pavel mentioned uh, at the beginning of this uh, final event. We've been choosing two locations, one in France and one in Austria. So basically, the demonstrators in France, the demonstrator in France is uh, located in the south of France. So it benefits from a warm oceanic climate, uh, meaning that we don't have so much uh, energy need, I would say, for space heating. So roughly, I, I put the figure here, roughly uh, 2,000 heating degrees for uh, the city of Hagen. And one of the main also um, uh, criteria for choosing this demonstration uh, site was uh, that this is not connected or the building is not actually connected to a district heating. Um, the overall context in France is uh, that we have a large share, I would say, of electric uh, driven heating for both uh, domestic hot water and space heating. And this makes the, the system, the overall system, very with a high thermal sensitivity, I would say, so roughly uh, 2.5 uh, gigawatts per, uh, per outdoor degree. Um, so the main challenges knowing, knowing that are, uh, of course, energy efficiency, but it was a bit aside from the, the SCORS project, I would say. Introducing uh, renewable energy and part of that uh, being renewable electricity, of course. So we'll see, uh, we'll see that in, uh, in, uh, in the later slide. And also increased flexibility to deal first with uh, intermittency of renewable energy, but also to be able to build or build buildings that are uh, grid friendly, I would say. So in this work package eight, we've been demonstrating uh, several technology, uh, optimizing also the operation between those technology and see how this can uh, perform uh, or cover these challenges. Um, second objective also to increase self-consumption, of course, and self-production in a system that are economically uh, viable. That's also a main criteria for us. So demonstration site was chosen as a residential collective building. Uh, so a bit more than 100 small flats. Uh, and the building is quite large, as Pavel mentioned, so more than uh, 6,000 square meters. And it's including also services, so it's a residential a residence that include uh, several services like collective catering, swimming pool, and else. But the SCORES project will only focus on domestic hot water, space heating, and uh, HVAC, uh, HVAC um, usage, I would say. Recent building also, so this is compliant with the 2012 uh, building regulation in France, so meaning that the insulation, for instance, are quite uh, good for this building. In terms of technology, in this demonstrator, we were uh, <coughs> so the building is mostly for the space heating uh, supplied by a, a regular uh, air to air heat pump, I would say a VRV air to air heat pump. So this is not part of the SCORES project, but in the SCORES project, we were um, implementing and installing uh, several systems on this uh, building, which are actually some systems. Uh, focused for uh, covering the domestic hot water uh, needs, so PVT collectors, photovoltaic and thermal collectors, coupled to a water to water heat pump, uh, three actually of them, three times uh, 12 kilowatts, and uh, hot water storage as a sensible thermal storage, I would say. We've been also installing second life electrical battery uh, from 4C powers so to deal with a surplus of electricity, as mentioned also by uh, Hans uh, from Siemens, and uh, also electric driven heaters, uh, including uh, latent heat storage in form of PCM, thanks to PCM, sorry, 
in uh, two two apartments only. Uh, on the overall system, the overall system is also coordinating the coordinated by the BEMS from Siemens so building energy management system. So you can see on the bottom of this slide several pictures of those systems. So first uh, PVT plus uh, water to water heat pump and um, and uh, water tank, hot water tank, electric heaters from Kampa, uh, four C power uh, batteries uh, in this uh, in this picture, and then the BEMS also uh, schematics. So the demonstration phase uh, started a few months ago. So we are still working on this and still uh, analyzing the, the data um, to, to be able to give qualitative and quantitative analysis on the performances of all these components individual, individually, but also on the overall system. So basically, one of the Outputs for now are the, the split between different usage. So we can see, for instance, the, the heating and comparing the, the space heating needs uh, provided by the VRV system uh, between 2020 and 2021 last year, cooling and so demand, domestic hot water also. And the figure I would say on the, on the right side is also showing performance performances and energy, um, part of energy um, coming from the domestic hot waters from uh, Ediopac. So you can see the bar graph in red that are representing useful energy for thermal energy for providing domestic hot water. And then you have uh, electricity that are that is needed to, to actually provide this uh, thermal energy. So you have usually a large share of electricity that are um, that is used for the heat pump and small part which is used for the backup. So, so basically the COP coefficient of performance is quite good, around three, I would say, and even so, so it's real life demonstration also. So we we had we observed some um, issues in uh, interfacing uh, between the different components of the system. So that's why at some point we we had some huge uh, part of backup consumption, but. Uh, those problems are mostly uh, solved now. Um, I think that's all for my part. I don't have so much uh, detail so far. As I said, the uh, phase phase is still in progress, and uh, I will uh, leave the floor again to 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 Susanna. Thank you very much, Jill. Uh, our next uh, demonstration site in Austria will be presented by Wim van Helden, uh, head of the Department of Technology Development at AE Intec. Wim, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Yes, the demo site in Austria, it's, uh, it's like in Argent, it's uh, meant to, to get more experience in practice with the systems that were devised in the SCORES project. Um, the system in, in Austria, next slide please, is, uh, is a mixed use um, system uh, in the sense that it consists of a, a two office buildings and two residential buildings that are coupled to, to each other. It, uh, it has a, is a complex that has been built in 1989 already with a very high efficiency standard. So the, the, the basic energy consumption of the, the building is, is low. So um, on the left you see the, the office buildings, on the right the residential buildings. Um, it's also connected to the district heating network of Gleisdorf. Gleisdorf is a, a small village uh, situated in the southeast of uh, Austria, near to Graz. And um, in the almost left corner, you can see uh, a small uh, lawn on which the test containers have been uh, placed, where the equipment of uh, Siemens and uh, Hedioparc uh, sorry, and uh, 4C power and of TNO was uh, situated. Next slide, please. So this is uh, how uh, how it looks like the energy system. The um, houses itself and the offices um, have a heating uh, system that is uh, wall and floor heating. So it's a, a low temperature heating system. 
it's also uh, it has a balanced ventilation uh, system with uh, heat recovery and there's also additionally the possibility of having a cooling through uh, the heating system so through the uh, wall and floor heating in summer um, by an absorption heat uh, absorption heat pump and also a, a compression heat system a cooling system uh, to the right, you see some pictures of the equipment that has been installed. Uh, the two uh, left pictures are inside the, the office building where the um, boiler room is. Uh, the two uh, yellow and blue uh, devices are the heat pumps from Heliopak. They uh, mm, consume the electricity locally as much as possible and the heat then generated, if not used directly, is stored in the green um, vessel, which is uh, on the bottom left uh, picture. Then, as mentioned, in, at the outside there were two containers. Uh, one container pictured here is uh, the container with a PV system on top of it, and inside the container is the BAMS uh, equipment and the heat batteries, as depicted here. In, uh, in this in this case we have five um, electrical batteries from uh, 4c power and also in the uh, in this container is the the converter system for the PV and battery control the other uh, container consists of the uh, CLC and the heat battery from uh, König Metall and TNO so what are the key technologies we have um, PV um, panels. They are combined with water-to-water uh, -water heat pumps as uh, depicted here and the 2000 liter storage. We have the second live electrical batteries and we have the electrical driven chemical looping combustion storage unit which as Pavel explained is emulated in this system. And of course the building energy management system and the fact that um, <clears throat> Gleisdorf has a, has a combined functionality so not only offices but also residential function makes uh, say the um, the functionality or makes the the target for the BAM system uh, more complicated than when it would only have been one functionality this is what we would like to show about the uh, Austrian demo and I'll give back to Susanna for the remainder of this presentation thank you thank you Vim uh, the next, the next uh, portion of uh, our uh, event is the Q&A uh, session. Uh, we have uh, received some questions, so uh, partners or speakers have uh, prepared answers uh, to those questions. So we can go uh, to the next slide. The question we have is what happens with the heat production during the night? And uh, we have answer prepared by Clement. So Clement, the, uh, your answer. Yes. Yes, uh, we, we can wonder why the, what happens uh, the heat production during the night uh, regarding the heat pump and domestic hot water production. Um, actually, the solar uh, heat collector that we use, uh, can you shift to the next slide, please? Uh, please uh, the, the roof collectors that we use are collecting the heat from the ambient air and the atmosphere uh, more than uh, only the radiation. So uh, it's a uh, yes, 80 20 uh, ratio. So it can also work uh, quite well uh, during the night uh, if the ambient temperature is not too, too low, of course. Uh, yes, it's a, it's a convective uh, transfer actually. Uh, that's all for me. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another question uh, about the building energy management system and the question is if it can be technically implemented in any building and the uh, answer will be uh, by Hans. Okay, uh, the answer is basically yes and no. No, because a couple of things need to be in place before you uh, can use touch the system. You need to have some kind of energy storage or you need to have equipment that can be controlled. For example, if you have an office building and you want to switch off the lights, yeah, that doesn't work in practice. So energy savings there is, is a no-go. So you need either a battery or a storage tank or stuff like that. What would be, what would be nice to have in this case 
would be smart energy meters. So you can uh, draw up a profile based on outside temperature, based on weather conditions, based on uh, the, the time of the day, because Monday mornings look slightly different than Friday, Friday afternoons. So the better your profile and the better you can predict the profile, the better you can um, predict what will happen and the better a decision uh, can be reached from the, from the BEMS. Um, and of course, what helps to make the, 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 the BEMS economically feasible is when you have some kind of pricing scheme that's that's favorable. If you have very um, good conditions for delivering back to the grid in Holland, they're yeah, not that great, frankly. You get, three, I think, three cents uh, per kilowatt hour. That's almost nothing. Um, and if you compare that to the, to the cost of electricity, there's a there's a mismatch. If those prices are better together, then the the implementation chances are are much better. I'll hand back to you. Thank you for the answer. We have uh, another question for you. What does the control loop of the system look like, and what systems can be uh, connected? Okay, that's a, a slightly more technical question. Um, can you go to the next one, please? some backup slides um what you what, what you have in, have in practice is that you have a, um, a field equipment that communicates somehow with the bands so you uh, you use either modbus or bucknet or some kind of protocol that the the controllers can interface with um so you, you need communication from there all the stuff enters into the, the controller that uh, changes the yeah, let's say the, the local communication language to something that it can understand and in our case that's that's bucknet it builds bucknet objects because they're fairly easy to work with um, those will be transferred to the uh, to the BEM system and they can make sense of what's what's happening there uh, based on that the, it will devise a strategy and the strategy will be communicated back to the controller and back to the uh, the, the, uh, the interface units back to the uh, the field equipment and once again once the field equipment acts the controllers will sense okay something is happening and it feed, will feed back that information to the bands as a as a check um second part of the question is which which uh, languages can be uh, connected that can be yeah, as i said a bucknet but also knx or uh, there are a couple of more depends a bit on the on the strategy but in principle from the protocols that are available, about 50% can uh, can be used. Follow-up question we have. Uh, so what happens when we want to connect a non-standard uh, um, to the to the BEMS? Okay. Um, well, the BEMS is, is made out of uh, modules. Um, and every module, for example, a heat pump or a CLC, has a, has a separate module. And once extra or other equipment is is connected, then we have to uh, insert a new model into the BEMP system, um, and that model can contain either anything standard, or we can program it ourselves to see what's uh, to mimic the behavior of the the equipment in the, in question. So you you can change, uh, let's say, a system that is is already running, or update it, or do something with it to map basically reality. And the fact that it's modular simply means you, you put it in and the BAMS will see, ah, okay, I have, a, I have a new module, this equipment, and it will take that with it in its, uh, in its decision. Thank you very much. Uh, we have run out of time for more questions. We have received some more, so we will uh, keep those uh, for the panel discussion if there's Great. time. Thank you very much, Hans, for uh, answering. Now we would like to give a uh, floor uh, to our cluster project, Hybrid. Uh, we have a presenter, Mireya fernandez Noirat from uh, Comsa company. She's uh, head of the technological innovation energy unit in the uh, research and development uh, department. So Mireya, the floor is yours. Hello, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Mireia Fernandez and I am from COMSA and I'm the project coordinator of, of Hybel. Okay, first of all, I would like to thank you uh, to the project's course, uh, our sister project, for giving the opportunity to us to present this, this project into this forum. 
the project uh, was going to be presented by myself and by uh, UDL, uh, University of Lleida, but they cannot attend the, the event. So instead, uh, 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 ITAE CNR will be, will be presenting the technical part. So I will be presenting the high in a nutshell, and uh, after after me it will come Valeria Palomba uh, to to present the rest of the of the project. High is an innovation project uh, funded by uh, Horizon 2020 about the innovative compact, compact hybrid electrical and thermal uh, thermal storage uh, systems for uh, low energy buildings. Okay, the project started in uh, October 2017. And it will end in March 2020, so next month after 54 uh, months. And uh, is a is a real research and innovation uh, action, and the funding is uh, almost six million euros. Uh, the consortium uh, is formed by 20 partners uh, among nine countries in the in the UN. Okay, here you can see all the partners. Uh, it's um, Comsa, uh, as I said before, we are the technical coordinator, uh, the sorry, the coordinators, the general coordinators, and then uh, University of Lleida, they are the technical coordinators. The rest of the partners are uh, ITAE CNR, uh, AIT, University of Cyprus, Cyprus, uh, NTUA, uh, R2M, EURAC, Fahrenheit, CSM, uh, Stress, Micrometal, Pink, Engineering, Ofner, Diking, uh, AK. G, Municipality of Almatret, Novatec, and Municipality of Aglantia. Uh, in the Highville project, uh, two innovative uh, highway storage concepts have been developed. One is for the Mediterranean climate and pr primarily uh, for cooling uh, the energy supply. Uh, we associated with this uh, concept, there are two, two demos, one in Aglantia in Cyprus and the other one in Almatret, close to Lleida in Spain. And then the, the other concept is for the continental climate, and uh, it's primarily for, meant for heating and domestic hot water supply, and is located in Austria, in Langewan, Austria. Um, the, two, uh, the, the project is based on these uh, four uh, innovative components that you can see here in this, in this picture. The DC-powered uh, reversible heat pump, the DC bus generator, compact sorption module, and the high density Latin storage. And now I give the floor to Valeria Palomba from uh, ITA CNR, who will be presenting the rest of the, of the presentation. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so the Mediterranean system, uh, as Mireia already said, is mainly meant for cooling dominated uh, climates. It focuses on a uh, um, vapor compression heat pump that is connected on the evaporator side to, um, uh, or includes on the evaporator side, a low temperature latent storage in consisting of a Free fluids heat exchanger where the refrigerator, the heat pump, the PCM, and the transfer fluid uh, for the distribution system um, coexist. And uh, on the condenser side, it is connected to a uh, sorption storage that allows a better uh, operation of the heat pump by lowering the condensation temperature. In addition, uh, electrical um, energy stored. Uh, by means of uh, high um, density and um, long life uh, lithium titanate oxide batteries. Next, next slide. Uh, yes, please, next slide. Uh, yes, as I was saying, the absorption module is uh, a part of this. Next slide. And this is the latent storage. Next slide. And we have the electrical storage. For the continental system, um, the main component is the vapor compression heat pump connected to a three fluid exchanger on the condenser side for domestic hot water provision. Next slide. That you can see here. Um, next slide. The uh, high temperature latent storage 
is connected to uh, building apartments through the pink and box solution the slide and we have the electric storage connected to the C bus as well the slide we have three demo sites, as Mireille already said, one in Almatret, one in Langenwang, and one in Aglansha. Uh, that apart from the technical solution, uh, include the advanced control um, developed by engineering and UDL using uh, artificial intelligence techniques. Uh, next slide. This is the uh, overview of the project. So we started with the uh, definition of the KPIs of the system and the um, first design of the system. Then uh, during the second year, uh, the components were tested in uh, lab scale. And uh, at the same time, the advanced control were uh, um, uh, developed. Then uh, from the third year onward, we started the installation in the demo sites and the subsequent uh, monitoring, uh, which is still uh, in place uh, right now. Next slide. These, uh, these are some pictures of the uh, systems installed uh, in uh, the lab. So the picture uh, um, on the upper part is the uh, continental uh, heat pump uh, in the AET uh, lab system, la, la, laboratory, while uh, the pictures uh, on the bottom refer to the Mediterranean system uh, installed in our lab. You can see on the left uh, the heat pump with the integrated uh, latent storage, uh, then in the middle the suction module and on the right, the uh, DC bus with the electrical storage. Next slide. And these are some pictures of the system uh, installed in the Mediterranean demos. Um, on, on the left, uh, you can see the uh, linear panel collectors uh, with main feature compared to the other standard commercial system is the fact that they are done with uh, smaller size mirrors, which uh, allows a better focusing and also um, a better scalability of the system uh, uh, also for non-industrial or large-scale application and then the DC bus connected to the subscription module and the uh, storage um, for the, the sensible storage for the linear funnel collectors and finally uh, on the right the heat pump uh, while the pictures uh, on the bottom refer to the uh, demo site in Aglantia. Next slide. Uh, this is, uh, these are some pictures of the system installed in uh, Langenwang that was uh, mainly intended for testing under winter conditions. So the installation took place during uh, 2020 and then we have already uh, completed uh, at least one year of monitoring of the system. Um, spring uh, um, data uh, are also included. Uh, it's possible uh, uh, to see that several uh, KPIs were addressed and system management occurred through the um, advanced uh, controls uh, developed. Next slide. Uh, Apart from the um, technical um, assessment of the performance of the system, uh, attention was put also on the environmental, economical and social aspects of the deployment of this technology. So uh, an LCA was carried out by uh, UDL uh, that allowed to identify the main uh, um, points um, where uh, environmental uh, uh, performance or environmental impact of the system, of course. Um, and uh, life cycle costing uh, was also recently completed. And thanks also to stress and RINA, social life cycle assessment was carried out according to UNEP um, uh, guidelines. And it was possible to see that the uh, social impact uh, for the system uh, is uh, quite good, uh, indicating that 
uh, even though uh, some improvements are needed as it is to be expected by uh, um, technology that is uh, under development now, it can be or it is uh, uh, socially accepted. Next slide. Uh, so to summarize what we uh, achieved within uh, high build uh, according to what was uh, the main goal before starting a project. So we had high efficiency conversion and storage um, so using electricity for, through it pumps to uh, convert it that was fully integrated with storage systems. Uh, all the systems are can work under different modes. So for the Mediterranean climate, the main focus was to achieve high efficiency in cooling provision and for the continental climate to achieve high efficiency in domestic hot water and heating production. production. And um, thanks to the inclusion of the disruption storage, it's also possible to work at different uh, um, time scale and to address uh, um, services to the grid, both uh, uh, for uh, daily fluctuations and peak shaving with the latent storage and electrical storage and uh, long term using the um, thermochemical system. Next slide. Finally, uh, some uh, um, key impacts uh, from the project. Uh, you can see here that 19 papers uh, were submitted and 18 published. Uh, all of them uh, can be found on OpenAire and on Zendo. I encourage you all to have a look at them. Next slide. And uh, at the same time, the project uh, was participating to uh, different uh, dissemination events also in synergy with other European projects, such as the Sustainable Places uh, uh, conferences and as part of the Renewable Eating and Cooling uh, platform. Next slide. And uh, two patents were uh, uh, filled regarding the integration of the uh, PCM inside the heat pump. And uh, some of the key exploitable results are also available on the Horizon Results platform. Again, I encourage you to have a look at them. Next slide. Uh, finally, um, we identified, identified which would be the future of uh, high build technologies. And um, most of the partners are willing to um, continue with the development of the technologies, uh, uh, especially regarding the storage components and um, the uh, advanced control. And um, the idea is to exploit Horizon Europe uh, fundings and national fundings for uh, bringing these technologies to TRL9 in two to three years for most of the uh, components. Next slide. So, uh, just to conclude, uh, we deny build uh, two um, systems uh, that include the thermal and electric storage and uh, um, power to its systems were uh, deployed uh, and uh, brought to TL6 by the Mosite installation and monitoring. Uh, the environmental, economic, and social aspects were considered, and business models were also developed, um, which uh, foresee the commercialization of most of the components for uh, uh, in, in the market uh, in a couple of years, while uh, for uh, the overall system deployment uh, in uh, residential or commercial buildings, uh, further development is needed. Uh, thank you. I think this is the last slide. Thank you very much, uh, Valeria. As Valeria said, uh, we will hear more from Hybrid during the panel discussion where we can uh, compare the results of these two projects and uh, discuss, uh, uh, discuss further. And now let's uh, have a break. Uh,
it's a bit more than five minutes. We will uh, begin again at uh, 11.25. Uh, so see you then when we will discuss the future of the SCORS technologies. So uh, see you at 11.25. Uh, And welcome back uh, from the break. Now uh, let's look at the future with the SCORES technologies. Uh, looking first at the system simulation with Keith O'Donovan from uh, research at AE Intec. So Keith, the floor is yours. Thank you, Susanna. Okay, so yeah, thank you everyone who's uh, still listening. So I'm going to firstly address the topic of system simulations, which were a pretty significant part of the project. And firstly, to address why we need system simulations. So in the project, they serve two purposes. And the first one was to be able to test the BEMS algorithm in a, in a virtual environment. Uh, before actually commissioning it on the demonstration site itself. And the second function of the system simulations were to uh, evaluate a number of scenarios for so-called SCORES future systems, where we have the ability to scale up our storage and PV technologies such that uh, self-consumption can be optimized. So not just storage capacities, uh, but also external electricity markets, so we can assess the impact of either flat tariff or day-ahead pricing schemes on the economic performance. Um, so like the demonstration systems, we modeled both the French and Austrian buildings uh, in the simulation environment, uh, as alongside all of the um, individual subsystems that make up these buildings. And for each... Uh, okay, let's, uh, let's give Keith a uh, chance to uh, come back. Uh, let's uh, continue with the presentation. Let's go to the next presenter, uh, which is uh, Claudia Portolano from uh, RENA Consulting, uh, who will present the market assessment of the SCORE system. Thank you, Susanna. Good morning, everyone. I hope this short presentation may give you an overview of the qualitative market assessment analysis, which has been provided during the project. Okay. Okay, in this slide, an assessment of the market of a hybrid storage system is provided, analyzing three of the key markets linked to the scores one and the drivers and barriers the market is characterized by. The market of the global hybrid battery energy storage system was valued at $35 billion in 2020 and is expected to grow at a compound annual growth rate of 7.5% to reach $58 billion by 2027. Europe in 2020 represented the second geographical area in terms of market share in the sector following North America. Also, the energy storage market shows a steady growth in terms of market revenues experienced from 2016 and 2020, and it is expected to continue increase by 2025. Also, in this case, Europe owns the second position by market revenues level after East Asia and uh, Pacific. For what concerns thermal market in the figure, it is possible to observe the most developing markets in terms of growth rate. The best performing markets are located in Asia Pacific, America, Middle East, and Africa. Europe doesn't show a significant growth rate, but uh, from the market size point of view, it represents uh, the third area. The most important market drivers are those reported in this slide, so the backup power, electric thermal, the solar photovoltaic, and other distributed generation systems, and the recent sharp increase in prices. Uh, as barriers, we can analyze them uh, by two sides, uh, barriers to the growth of stationary energy storage market and the barriers to the development of current PCM heat storage products. 
for the first kinds of barriers so we can find as examples lack of familiarity with storage technology high upfront cost the need for highly skilled and experienced technicians and regulations preventing third party or customer ownership of certain dares and preventing storage from energy ancillary services air capacity barriers to deployment of carriers uh, pcm in storage products instead some example could be um, limited customer knowledge a lack of supply chain for pcm products the availability of safe reliable pcm materials with melting points suitable for most eating technologies in this uh, growth market contest, we could imagine to launch the score system on the market with an uh, only example of a business model. This is just an example. This example foresee uh, where the project uh, involved companies are joined in a partnership with them to pursue the diffusion of the score hybrid system, commercializing it directly to the building owners, so the end users, and to the ESCOs, which can then install the system and sell the energy service to the final end users. The value proposition will allow on the innovative content of uh, scores, uh, which allows uh, the increase of self-consumption and the reduction of the energy bills, so maximizing the self-production. We uh, can imagine the sale of different packaging services, customizing the system with different technologies in order to satisfy exactly the customer's needs. And this will reflect also in potential different prices at which sell them on the market. The score cyber system will guarantee mid and long term storage of a surplus of cheap heat and electricity, avoiding expensive peak loads, improving the resilience of the grids. And um, for what concerns this, uh, its structure about the cost, they may rely on the cost of a single component and all the operational and marketing costs to uh, improve the commercialization of the services. To be able to reach this kind of model, the SCORSA hybrid system needs to further technology developments to be ready for the market entrance. The components need to be scaled up in their production to reach the mass production scale volume and further reduce their production costs and be allowed to be sold at competitive prices, entering in the growth stage of the SCORSA product life cycle. But once the technologies will be reliable and its price is more competitive, thanks to its great potentiality and the high competence of the partners involved in the project, it will be hopefully foreseen, and we uh, believe in it, um, a potential widespread diffusion of the system, allowing to enter in its maturity stage and to offer at full level all its innovative content to the end users. Thank you very much. It's all for my side. Thank you very much, Claudia, for uh, taking over the presentation after Keith. We have uh, Keith back, so uh, let's go back uh, to his presentation, at, which stopped at slide 121. So let's see if he's back. Welcome. Hello again. Sorry about that technical problem. Um, so we got as far as 121, you said? Yes. Okay, um, so just back to what we were discussing that for each uh, simulation case, we defined uh, respective reference case buildings and self-generation cases to uh, see the impact of uh, introducing the PV system and heat pumps alone. And then finally, the SCORES future system builds further upon our self-generation case with the inclusion of uh, the storage technologies such as the electric batteries, the CLC and PCM, as well as the BEMS algorithm, which regulates the charging and discharging of each of these storages such that self-consumption can be optimized. And the general workflow for the simulation was to build up a physical model of each building in Daimala simulation environment. And the main parameter inputs which we investigated are namely the storage capacities um, as well as uh, different electricity pricing tariffs and as the simulation runs it's constantly exchanging data with the BEMS algorithm so sending information to and from the BEMS and at each time step the BEMS is looking ahead a couple of hours to predict uh, upcoming surpluses or deficit in PV energy 
And based on this, the BEM sends uh, controls back to the simulation uh, to decide whether to charge or discharge any of the storages, including the battery system or the more long-term storages, such as the CLC reactors. And so the main outputs on the simulation, then we can see a number of technical performance indicators, such as the degree of self-consumption and the relative reduction in electricity or heat from the external grids. And as a separate step then in another work package, there's a techno-economic analysis, which is carried out on each of these future system cases where overall savings and um, levelized costs for each of the individual technologies can be analyzed. And this should assist in choosing a, an optimum uh, scores configuration, both in terms of cost and self-consumption. Uh, so here's just an example of some outputs based on parameter sweeps, which we've carried out. Uh, this is for the French future system. So for a range of different battery capacities, we can see uh, the increase in relative reduction of grid electricity with respect to our reference cases. Um, also of interest to us was to compare the difference in behavior when we look at either flat uh, electricity price tariffs where we only charge our battery system with excess PV or on the right side we see a case where we run uh, with day ahead electricity prices where the batteries are also being charged at short notice from the grid during periods of cheap electricity and discharging um, during the expensive periods. So all of these inputs are investigated in the system models and are to serve as a way to see the performance of our system if the individual technologies have reached the stage of maturity which could not be demonstrated on the actual sites. Um, so the general outlook is that we could see uh, very high reductions in grid electricity with these assumptions in mind. Uh, cost, regarding cost, there's still a lot of uncertainty about some of these technologies as they are in their early stages of development. Um, there is ongoing work still now with the simulations as the demonstration sites are running. Another task, as mentioned at the beginning, is to use the simulation models to uh, make a comparison with the real behavior of the BEMS in the demo and to validate as far as possible the monitoring data. So that's um, essentially it for me on the simulations. Thank you for being patient to listen to some slides twice. So I move back to Susanna now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Keith. Our next topic is the social impact assessment of the course project and the presenter is uh, Adelia Gafurva from uh, Phoenix DMT. Adelia, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you. In the work package 9, we have task 9.5, according to which we need to ensure acceptance by market participants and end users, individual behaviors and choices to be analyzed in a socioeconomic context within the European region. In month 54, which is April 2022, uh, we will submit deliverable 9.9, .9, potential social impact of the project and users' engagement. For the last year, we have been conducting the survey with the purpose to collect the views of different stakeholders and identify their preferences related to hybrid energy storage systems. The questionnaire is short, simple, and consists of eight questions, seven of which are multiple choice questions. It was promoted through the project channels, such as project social media, project website, and network of connection of partners. As you can see from question one and question two, most of the respondents are end users and researchers, predominantly from France and the Netherlands. Question three asked which buildings are most suitable for the integration of hybrid energy storage systems. And you can see that responses are distributed similarly between all options. Question four tried to find out how respondents assess their knowledge of hybrid energy storage systems you can see from the graph that most people answered between five and seven which means they are relatively aware of the technology question five figured out that the most important factors for the respondents if deciding to adopt the technology are profitability low environmental impact and energy efficiency 
Answers to the question six showed that high investments and immature technology are the main barriers that are likely to prevent from adopting the technology. 69% of respondents would want to be involved in manufacturing, installing, or using hybrid energy storage systems, which is, which is definitely a good sign. And finally, question eight was an open question asking to share their opinion on the technology. As you can see, most answers are very positive about hybrid energy storage systems. You can see such comments as promising, crucial, essential, that it is a promising, crucial, and essential technology for the future. However, there, are, there were some also negative statements, for example, that it is a good idea only on paper, that it is not worth the effort, and that there is no skilled labor for that. Well, the point is to analyze all feedback and to adjust the technology development accordingly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adelia. We will, of course, share uh, the results of the whole uh, assessment uh, on the uh, on the project uh, channels and on the website. Uh, our last presenter before our panel discussion is uh, Luis Coelho, a professor at Instituto Politecnico de Setubal, who will present the training activities of the SCORES project. Luis, the floor is yours. Sorry, <laughs> good morning, everyone. So I will make a brief presentation about the uh, training activities. Um, can you pass next slide, please? Okay, so the objectives of the training activities are the, to perform training activities, exploiting instructions, processes, and tools developed in framework of the project, and distribute them to a, a wider community of profession, professionals relevant for production, design, application, and installations. Um, so, supporting activities to include videos, seminars, webinars, and courses and two training demo site seminars will be organized. So next slide, please. Oh, sorry, okay. Um, so uh, we have produced eight, uh, eight um, videos related with the uh, different technologies developed in the project. Um, so you uh, can use uh, this link above to um, access the videos. And the videos will be available on the SCORES YouTube channel uh, next week. Oops, very sorry. Okay. Uh, we uh, organized one webinar um, about innovative renewable solutions for re residential buildings. It was organized within the Event World Sustainable Energy Days uh, last uh, uh, June. Uh, and now we are preparing uh, the second webinar about towards total decar decarbonization of buildings by 2050, the role, the role of the SCORES solution um, project. So um, we will provide more information soon. And I hope, uh, I hope that you have uh, your interest and your participation at this uh, webinar. And now we are also organizing the training course on thermal energy storage for heating, cooling, and domestic hot water for buildings. Uh, this course will be held physically at the National Energy Agency facilities in Lisbon, Portugal, on 1st of April. Uh, we will also provide uh, more information so, uh, soon. Um, and the last Training activities is about the two training demo site seminaries. Uh, we uh, uh, also are preparing these two training site uh, seminaries online. Um, so we will organize one training demo site seminary about the demo site A in Glass of Austria, and the second one about the demo site B in Agen, France. So we will also provide more information soon, and I hope that you are able to participate in these uh, uh, the different training activities. Thank you very much. And now I pass the floor to Susanna. Thanks. Thank you very much, Luis. We are uh, very happy uh, to invite you to all the uh, other events uh, the project will be organizing. Uh, now, uh, let's move to the panel discussion. Uh, moderator of the discussion will be Pavel Bodic, but we, of course, invite all the partners, uh, all the speakers uh, to join in and discuss, uh, mainly uh, 
with in cooperation with Hybel to kick off the the discussion and to uh, introduce. Um, we have a question uh, from the audience uh, to Pavel, who was mentioned uh, is uh, one of the partners who uh, is in charge of the main result of the project or one of the results of the project, uh, the new company which uh, which will be established. The question is: uh, Is there a timeline timeline for this new company and when the products will be available? And, well, thank you for the question and thanks for the introduction, Susanna. Uh, the new company has been established in January. The timeline for bringing the products on the market is uh, we start with the uh, field tests uh, from the middle of this year and uh, a small scale think of uh, thousands of uh, pieces production will be made. Uh, we'll start in 2023. So in principle, uh, orders can flow in at any point in time uh, with deliveries uh, in about one year. That would be the answer to the question. And then um, uh, from the perspective of the of the panel discussion, um, uh, I, Zuna, do we have more questions available from the audience? Because I don't see any in the in the tool here. Uh, uh, not, currently, so. not currently. So in the meantime, I have a question to the to the high build team, and I'm not sure who to address it. I'm going to address it to the high build team as such. Uh, uh, first of all, a really nice work and a very nice progress in many technologies that you guys have, uh, uh, let's say, taken the next step uh, in the in the high build project. I was wondering, uh, what is the status, or could you tell a little bit more about the, the control systems uh, in the in the buildings themselves? Uh, are they demonstrated uh, as a scientific type of uh, control systems, or and how do you plan to uh, commercialize that aspect of the of your demonstrations? Okay, so the control system was developed by um, engineering and UDL, and uh, it's meant to. It, there are two levels of control. So there is the low level control and the high level control. The low level control relies on, on the um, platforms and systems already in place by the manufacturers or the, the various technologies. Um, so basically commercial uh, PLC, while the high level control uh, is uh, um, running on an industrial PC right now. And um, basically uh, it takes data from, uh, takes weather data, electricity um, data from the grid and uh, sends the input to the low level controllers. Um, from the uh, exploitation uh, point of view in, uh, in the future, um, the idea is to refine the control uh, also within other uh, projects um, that have already been uh, funded. And uh, finally, uh, there has not been a discussion on um, um, possible uh, patents or uh, software for commercialization uh, available. So this is still uh, an open uh, discussion. I don't know if this uh, answers to your question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's clear. So it was university developed at UDL and uh, you're looking at uh, taking the next step in the follow-up projects to bring it closer to the market. Uh, no, it, was, it was developed by UDL and engineering, which is... Um, oh, the Western engineering, okay. Commercial, yeah commercial uh, multinational um, company uh, with a quarter in uh, Italy. So uh, the idea is in case to develop that based on engineering platforms. Yeah, clear. Oh yeah, yeah, I see. I, I was also, I thought it was UDL engineering as a part of your, in part of the university, but I see now in the names of the companies in your, uh, in your one of your presentation sheets that that's uh, indeed a partner. Clear, well, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to invite all uh, other participants from both uh, this course and uh, and uh, uh, hybrid projects also to uh, let's say ask questions uh, of an interest that they have. We have we have another uh, question since we heard about the follow up activities of uh, high build. Uh, are there any follow up activities also for scores except uh, uh, the ones we have uh, talked about? Maybe this question to all partners. Uh, so uh, please uh, speak out. Uh, 
So in the meantime, I can say that for uh, TNO, we have a continuation together with uh, most of the, with some of the scores partners yeah, and aiming to submit the proposal in the coming call on the thermal uh, uh, energy storage uh, of Horizon Europe. Uh, I believe the deadline is uh, late April. Uh, and we plan to take the concept of uh, thermal energy storage systems in buildings to the next level uh, in that in that call. I would say from a, from a Siemens perspective, Hans Henne here, um, we we learned a couple of things during the project, and that's already finding its way into our let's say uh, products in the Netherlands. So things we, we we saw in the field, like okay, you need to include these and these rare variables to do some uh, stuff in the future. We already put that in our products right now. So that's ongoing. For the future, I'm not sure. That's something uh, up to uh, to headquarters. But I assume uh, we'll continue with this. Thank Hans. Uh, other technology partners uh, looking at. Uh, Perhaps uh, Heliopark with their effectively a commercial system. What are your plans forward? Yes, I'm Take here. Lamont, thanks. Um, yes, so uh, on Heliopark uh, point of view, it was nice to develop a, a Modbus interface, and uh, also we we uh, we took advantage of the scores pro project by uh, implementing, uh, for example, uh, new circulators into our system, like uh, intelligent uh, ones. And uh, we, we learned from that. And uh, this way we can uh, move on uh, with that. Uh, mm -hmm. with it. Yeah. All right. Um, I have myself uh, still maybe a question to um, which I'm always curious to ask uh, to all partners to develop storage technologies. Uh, if they could uh, comment on the uh, energy density of uh, their systems, there's always this uh, beliefs that the specific technologies are limited in their in their specifications to how much energy can be stored in certain volumes. For houses, that is very critical aspect. So uh, maybe from uh, if uh, if the storage uh, technology providers in scores, and perhaps also Valeria for uh, for high build could comment on the energy density on a system level that their products or future products could uh, count on. Yes, um, but the point the, the latent storage system that we used was optimized in order to be um, embedded within uh, the heat pump. So the majority of effort was put uh, into uh, producing a design that could be suitable for the integration of the heat pump. And as I said, this has already has also been um, patented by AT, AKG and Oxner. Um, regarding the uh, subsection storage, um, still uh, some um, work is, uh, is being done because the um, configuration of the system uh, is still being optimized. Uh, we have also uh, under other uh, Horizon 2020 uh, funded calls um, some projects ongoing in which we are uh, planning to realize the uh, actual cascade integration of the absorption storage with the heat pump with uh, um, le a lower number of components. So uh, as it is so far, we have uh, actually a full uh, uh, absorption system with uh, the absorbers and condenser and evaporator, and uh, it is connected hydraulically to the heat pump. Within other projects, we are aiming at creating one single component that shares um, an integrated um, evaporator condenser for the heat pump, so, so to further reduce the um, density of the system. The um, Let's say that uh, compared to um, uh, commercial systems that can provide uh, um, more or less uh, the required capacity by multifamily buildings, we um, highlighted more or less 20% uh, um, higher uh, energy density for the overall system. Clear. Thank you very much. Uh, very nice.
Um, I don't have myself uh, more questions. I'm not sure how much time we have left, uh, Zuzana, but I think a couple of minutes left to go. So there are still opportunities to to join the discussion with either observations or, or questions to other participants. We can see Vim. Uh, do you have do you have anything to share? Yes, yes, I would like to share the uh, the fact that that in, in parallel also we are working on compact thermal energy storage uh, module and system development. And in a recently finished uh, project, um, we arrived at uh, say 140 kilowatt hours per cubic meter for hot tap water and room heating applications. But as, as you mentioned, Pavel, it's, uh, it's really um, very important to make sure that you have the proper definition of what the storage density should be. So uh, taking into account also the volumes of those components that you need to charge and discharge your, your module. So on a system level, this would lead to uh, not 140 kilowatt hours per cubic meter, but to say about 60 or 70 kilowatt hours per cubic meter because you also need to account for, th for the volume of the additional components. Mm -hmm. And in an um, in Austrian-funded follow-up project, we will demonstrate uh, these sorption systems uh, both in a, in a hotel restaurant setting and also in a, in a single-family house. So we would like to make that the next step into showing that this uh, this uh, storage technology is, uh, say, is demonstrable. Yeah. Nice. Thanks, Wim. I see Gilles also uh, joining. Yeah, I mean, for the, um, I was thinking about your question, Pavel, on uh, project perspective and uh, what this uh, project uh, brings us and what could be the next uh, step, at least for. Yes, so we are not a technology provider as such. Uh, we are more uh, focusing on on, uh, on a role of uh, electricity producer or I would say a grid operator. Even though we have some um, business unit in uh, in uh, self consumption for uh, for residential or B two C uh, clients, uh, but nevertheless, uh, one of our main goal is to uh, be able to anticipate what could be the the impact of uh, such system like the score systems on the on our production assets and also on the grid so making also this uh, building uh, grid friendly as i said uh, be uh, still a, a big challenge for us and uh, we want to make sure that uh, with this uh, storage capacity uh, distributed uh, over the building uh, be uh, uh, suitable for the operating uh, for operating the grid and uh, the production asset so we'll uh, continue to, to work on that. Also, uh, um, um, exchange with uh, several partner and technology uh, providers to, to test their technology, uh, either on the continental area, European continental, or also in uh, remote Iceland, where, where we have a specific constraint uh, with a grid being much, uh, much less stable, we uh, would say. Uh, and so integrating this uh, intermittent and renewable energy is uh, critical uh, for us if we want to to, to meet or the objective uh, that we have uh, national nationally, I would say, uh, for each uh, country in Europe. Thanks, Jill. I think that's a, that's a good remark uh, for the summary of our uh, of our workshop. So I will give my word back to Susanna. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pavel, for leading the discussion. Thank you to all who shared uh, their input in the discussion. I would like to thank uh, BuildUp for co-organizing uh, our event, of course, to HighBuild for joining us and sharing their uh, results and input. Uh, of course, the project is still running for uh, one and a half uh, more months, so uh, there are still more things to come. We have a policy workshop planned, we have the training activities, and of course, the final results will be shared with all of you. Uh, this uh, this uh, event was recorded, so feel free to share it with anyone who might be interested. It will be available on the SCORES uh, project YouTube channel, of course, linked on the website and uh, posted on about uh, 
on all our uh, profiles. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you to all the speakers who joined us today and uh, have a nice uh, rest of the day. Goodbye.